Sentences, Book Four by Peter Lombard. Excerpts, translated by Elizabeth Frances Rogers, 1892 to 1974, published in 1917. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Beginning on page 78. Note on the translation. Distinctions 1 through 26, earlier chapters of the fourth book of Peter Lombard's Sentences, which deals with the sacraments, has been translated from the Latin in the hope that they may be of use to some readers. My work has been painstakingly criticized and corrected by Dr. Louise R. Loomis, but I only am responsible for its errors, especially in the few passages where I venture to disagree with her. Poententia has been translated penance throughout, in accordance with Roman Catholic usage. Res presented much more serious difficulties. In the end, it was translated in nearly every case, thing, and it has been left to the reader to learn the content of the Latin word. Other translations were suited to only a few uses of the word, or else seemed to interfere with accepted philosophic terms. The only other alternative was to leave it untranslated, as Harnack does in his History of Dogma. The biblical references and quotations are according to the Douay version, which in some cases differs from the King James Version. Translation of Book 4, Distinctions, 1 through 26, of the Quartar Libre Sententiarum, of Peter the Lombard. Distinction 1, Part 1, 1, of Sacraments. The Samaritan who tended the wounded man applied for his relief the dressings of the sacraments, just as God instituted the remedies of the sacraments against the wounds of original and actual sin. Footnote. Luke 10, verse 30. End footnote. Concerning the sacraments, four questions first present themselves for consideration what a sacrament is, why it was instituted, wherein it consists, and how it is performed, and what the difference is between the sacraments of the old and the new covenants. 2. What a sacrament is. Quote, a sacrament is the sign of a sacred thing. Parenthesis res. Footnote. See Augustine 10 de Civ d c5 and 2 contra adversar legate et prof c nine n thirty four and footnote however a sacred mystery is also called a sacrament as the sacrament of divinity so that a sacrament may be the sign of something sacred and the sacred thing signified but now we are considering a sacrament as a sign so quote, a sacrament is the visible form of an invisible grace. End quote. Footnote. Berengar de Sacra Coena. See Augustine 3. Question in Pentateuch. Q84. End footnote. 3. What a sign is. Quote. But a sign is the thing. Parenthesis res behind the form which it wears to the senses, which brings by means of itself something else to our minds. Footnote. See Augustine 2 de Dr. Christ. C1 N1. End footnote. 4. How a sign and a sacrament differ. Furthermore, some signs are natural, as smoke which signifies fire, others conventional, and of those which are conventional, some are sacraments, some not, for every sacrament is a sign, but the converse is not true. The sacrament bears a resemblance to the thing of which it is a sign. 
for if sacraments did not bear a resemblance to the thing of which they are the sacraments they could not properly be called sacraments for a sacrament is properly so called because it is a sign of the grace of god and the expression of invisible grace so that it bears its image and is its cause sacraments therefore were not instituted merely in order to signify something but also as a means of sanctification for things which were instituted only to signify are signs only and not sacraments such as the sacrifices of flesh and the ceremonial observances of the old law which could never justify those who offered them because as the apostle says the blood of goats and of oxen and the ashes of an heifer being sprinkled and sanctify such as are defiled to the cleansing of the flesh but not of the spirit see hebrews nine thirteen now this uncleanliness was the touching of a dead body wherefore augustine by that defilement which the law cleanses i understand merely the touching of a dead body since any one who had touched one was unclean seven days but he was purified according to the law on the third day and on the seventh and was cleansed so that he might enter the temple the legal observances also cleansed sometimes from bodily leprosy but no one was ever justified by the works of the law as says the apostle even if he performed them in faith and charity see romans three twenty galatians two sixteen see also romans five fourteen quote, adam who is a figure of him who was to come End quote. End footnote. why because god has ordained them unto servitude not unto justification so that they might be types of something to come wishing that these offerings should be made to him rather than to idols they therefore were signs yet also sacraments although they are often called so incorrectly in the scriptures because they were rather signs of a sacred thing than availing anything themselves these moreover the apostle calls works of the law which were instituted only to signify something or as a yoke see romans three twenty galatians two sixteen acts fifteen ten five why the sacraments were instituted the sacraments were instituted for a threefold reason for humility instruction and exercise for humility so that while man by order of the creator abases himself in worship before insensible things which by nature are beneath him through his humility and obedience he may become more pleasing to god and more meritorious in his sight at whose command he seeks salvation in things beneath him yet not from them but through them from god for instruction also were the sacraments instituted so that the mind might be taught by what it sees outside in visible form to recognize the invisible virtue which is within for man who before sin saw god without a mediator through sin has become so dulled that he is in no wise able to comprehend divine things unless trained thereto by human things likewise the sacraments were instituted for exercise because since man cannot be idle there is offered him in the sacraments a useful and safe exercise by which he may avoid vain and harmful occupation for he who devotes himself to good exercise is not easily caught by the tempter wherefore jerome warns us quote, always do some sort of work that the devil may find you occupied end quote. Quote, there are moreover three kinds of exercises one aims at the edification of the soul another aims at the nourishment of the body another at the destruction of both end quote. and inasmuch as without a sacrament to which god has not limited his power 
he could not give grace to man he has for the aforesaid reasons instituted the sacraments Quote, these are two parts of which a sacrament consists namely words and things words as the invocation of the trinity things as water oil and the like page ninety one distinction three part two five of the institution of baptism as for the institution of baptism when it began there are various opinions some say baptism was instituted when christ told nicodemus unless a man be born again of water and of the holy spirit see john three five c f hugh of st victor two de sacraments page six c four others say baptism was instituted when he said to the apostles go ye teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit see matthew twenty eight nineteen but this he said to them after the resurrection in his instructions for the calling of the gentiles while before his passion he had sent them two by two to preach in judea and to baptize with the words go not aside unto the ways of the gentiles see matthew ten verse five at that time therefore was baptism instituted because they then both preached and baptized if now we are asked under what form the apostles then baptized we can surely reply in the name of the trinity that is under the form which they baptized the gentiles afterwards for we can understand that it was given them before the passion although it is not so recorded christ did not therefore first give them this form when he sent them to evangelize the gentiles but rather the form which he had given before when he sent them into judea he afterward repeated when he sent them to the gentiles accordingly it is more fitting to say that the institution was established when christ was baptized by john in the jordan which he arranged not because he wished to be cleansed since he was without sin but because by the contact of his pure flesh he bestowed regenerating power on the waters so that whosoever was afterwards immersed with the invocation of the name of the trinity might be cleansed from sin at that time therefore the baptism of christ was instituted by which the trinity whose mystery therein was made known baptizes a man within page ninety five distinction four part one one of those who received the sacrament and the thing parenthesis res and the thing and not the sacrament and the sacrament and not the thing here we must say that some received the sacrament and the thing some the sacrament and not the thing some the thing and not the sacrament all infants receive the sacrament and the thing at the same time who are cleansed in baptism from original sin although some deny that sins are forgiven to children who are about to die and support this opinion by the word of augustine sacraments accomplish what they symbolize in the elect only they do not understand that this must be interpreted that while the sacraments accomplish remission in others they do not do it for them unto salvation but only for the elect for that in baptism sin is remitted to all infants augustine clearly says quote, from the newborn infant to the decrepit old man just as no one is debarred from baptism so there is no one who does not die to sin in baptism but infants to original sin only adults however to all sins which they have added to original sin by evil living End quote unless the enormity of their life prevents some also who are baptized with faith receive the sacrament and the thing now to page one hundred and twelve distinction six three 
that no one may be baptized in his mother's womb we must also understand quote, that although immersion is performed three times on account of the mystery of the trinity yet it is counted only one baptism End quote. jerome two commentary on epistle ad ephesians four five c iodum modo eight one we are also not to be ignorant that no one can be baptized in his mother's womb even if the mother be baptized wherefore isidore quote, those who are in their mother's wombs cannot be baptized because he who is not yet born according to adam cannot be born again according to christ nor can we speak of the rebirth of one whose birth has not preceded it also augustine no one can be born again before he is born but if jeremiah and john the baptist be cited against this opinion because they were said to be sanctified from the womb as also some think was true of jacob we say that if they there received sanctification as inward cleansing it must be held among the miracles of divine power as augustine says speaking ambiguously about this if he says the use of reason and will was so far advanced in that boy that within the mother's womb he could already know and believe a thing that only age makes possible in other children it must be held among the miracles of divine power not taken as typical of human nature for when god willed it even an ass spoke also concerning jeremiah it is said before thou camest out of the womb i sanctified thee but that sanctification by which we are made the temple of god is only for the reborn for unless a man be born again of water and of the holy spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of god no one is born again unless he is already born wherefore this sanctification can be received according to predestination here he seems to speak doubtfully when he says it is not said that the infant believed in the womb but that he leaped nor did elizabeth say he leaped in faith but he leaped in the womb and this sanctification could be the sign of greatness recognized by the older person but not comprehended by the child he speaks without assertion of this sanctification not defining just how the sanctification is to be understood whether it be the sign of something to come or the truth of the justification accomplished by the spirit but it is better that we say that these two jeremiah and john were justified in the womb contrary to the common law and aided by grace all sins were forgiven them this is also taught by many testimonies of the saints page one twenty two distinction seven six of the sacrament and the thing parenthesis res now let us see what is the sacrament and what the thing parenthesis res Quote, the sacrament is the visible form of invisible grace the form therefore of the bread and wine which appears here is the sacrament that is the sign of a sacred thing because it calls something to mind beyond the appearance which it presents to the senses therefore the appearances keep the names of the things which they were before namely bread and wine seven that the thing res in parenthesis of this sacrament is twofold moreover the thing res of this sacrament is twofold one what it contained and signified the other is what it signified but not contained the thing contained and signified is the flesh of christ which he received from the virgin and the blood which he shed for us the thing signified and not contained is the unity of the church in those who are predestined called justified and glorified 
see first corinthians eleven twenty three this is the twofold flesh and blood of christ wherefore jerome quote, in two ways says he are the flesh of christ and his blood understood either the flesh which was crucified and buried and the blood which was shed by the lance of the soldier or that spiritual and divine body of which he himself says my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed and unless ye eat my flesh and drink my blood ye have not life in you see john six fifty six and fifty four therefore three things are to be distinguished here the first which is the sacrament only the second which is the sacrament and the thing quotations res and the third which is the thing and not the sacrament the sacrament and not the thing is the visible form of bread and wine the sacrament and the thing is the very flesh and blood of christ the thing and not the sacrament is his mystical flesh furthermore that visible form is the sacrament of something twofold because it signifies two things and bears the express likeness of two things for just as bread more than any other food restores and sustains the body and wine gladdens and inebriates man so the flesh of christ spiritually restores and sustains the inward man more than any other graces wherefore my chalice which inebriateth me how good it is see psalm twenty two verse five the visible form bears also a resemblance to a mystical thing which is the unity of the faithful because just as one loaf is made from many grains and wine from many grapes flow together so ecclesiastical unity is composed of the many persons of the faithful wherefore the apostle we being many are one bread and one body see first corinthians ten seventeen wherefore augustine the church is called one bread and one body because just as one loaf is composed of many grains and one body of many members so the church of many faithful is bound together by uniting charity this mystery is our peace and unity christ consecrated at his table he who receives this mystery of unity and does not keep the bond of peace receives this mystery not for himself but against himself and of this unity also christ's own body received from the virgin is the sacrament because as the body of christ was composed of many very pure and immaculate members so the society of the church is composed of many persons freed from the stain of sin as a type of this unity the ark of the lord was made of sedum wood which does not decay but is like white thorn see exodus twenty five ten page one hundred and thirty four distinction eleven part one one of the manner of conversion but if any one asks what the nature of that conversion is whether of form or of substance or of some other part i am not able to define i know however that it is not of form because the appearances of the things remain what they were before and the taste and weight to some it seems to be a change of substance for they say that the substance is so converted into substance that the latter becomes the former in essence with this opinion the foregoing authorities seem to agree but others make the following objections to this opinion if the substance of bread they say or of wine be converted into substance into the body or blood of christ a substance is daily made the body or blood of christ which previously was not and to-day there is a body of christ which yesterday was not 
and daily the body of christ is increased and formed of material of which at its conception it was not made to these we can reply as follows that the body of christ is not said to be made by the divine words in the sense that the very body formed when the virgin conceived is formed again but that the substance of bread or wine which formerly was not the body or blood of christ is by the divine words made this body and blood and therefore priests are said to make the body and blood of christ because by their ministry the substance of bread is made the flesh and the substance of wine is made the blood of christ yet nothing is added to his body or blood nor is the body or blood of christ increased page one hundred and fifty one distinction fourteen part one one of penance and why it is called penance next we must discuss penance penance is needful to those who are far from god that they may come near for it is as jerome says the second plank after shipwreck because if any one by sinning sullies the robe of innocence received in baptism he can restore it by the remedy of penance the first plank is baptism whereas the old man is laid aside and the new put on the second penance by which after a fall we rise again while the old state which had returned is disdained and the new one which had been lost is resumed those who have lapsed after baptism can be restored by penance but not by baptism a man is allowed to do penance often but not to be baptized often baptism is called only a sacrament but penance is called both a sacrament and virtue of the mind for there is an inner penance and an outer the outer is the sacrament the inner is the virtue of the mind and both are for the sake of salvation and justification but whether all outer penance is a sacrament or if not all what is to be classed under this name we shall investigate later with penance began the preaching of john who said do penance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and what the herald taught the truth afterwards preached beginning his discourse with penance see matthew three two and also matthew four seventeen page one hundred and sixty five distinction fifteen five what alms are for alms are a work of mercy as is most truly said have pity on thy own soul pleasing god they do not therefore deceive themselves who think that by abundant alms of their fruits or of their riches they buy themselves impunity and continue in their sins for they so love that they desire to remain in them but he who loves iniquity hateth his own soul and whoever hates his own soul is not merciful to it but cruel certainly by loving it according to the world he hates it according to god if therefore he wishes to give it alms through which it may be made clean let him hate it according to the world and love it according to god by the alms which a man owes first of all to himself the inner man is cleansed christ exhorts us to this and says make clean the things that are within for nothing is clean to the unclean but their minds and consciences are polluted as the apostle says but all are unclean whom faith does not cleanse by which we believe on christ and of this it is written cleansing their hearts by faith but lest it seem that christ rejects the alms which are offered of the fruits of the earth those he says ought to have been done that is judgment and love of god and the others not omitted that is alms of earthly fruits page one hundred and seventy seven 
distinction seventeen part one one whether sins are forgiven without confession here arises a question that has many parts for first we are asked whether without satisfaction and confession of the mouth by contrition of the heart only sin may be forgiven any one secondly whether it suffices for any one to confess to god without a priest thirdly whether confession made to a faithful layman would be valid on these points even the learned are found to think differently because the doctors seem to have taught varied and almost contradictory views about them for some say that without confession of the mouth and satisfaction of deed no one is cleansed from sin if he has time for doing these things but others say that before confession of the mouth and satisfaction through the contrition of the heart sin is forgiven by god if however the sinner has the desire to confess wherefore the prophet i have said i will confess against myself my injustices to the lord and thou hast remitted etc see psalm thirty one verse five which cassiodorus explained saying i have said that is i have determined within myself that i would confess and thou hast remitted it great pity of god who hast remitted the sin for the mere promise for the promise is accepted for the deed also augustine not yet does he make it known but he promises that he will make it known and the lord remits it because to say just this is to make something known in the heart not yet is a voice in the mouth but that a man may hear the confession and god hears also the sacrifice of god is a troubled spirit a contrite heart etc elsewhere we also read that whatever hour a sinner turns and laments he shall live in life and shall not die it does not say he confesses with his mouth but turns laments wherefore we are given to understand that even though the mouth be silent we may sometimes obtain pardon hence the lepers also whom the lord commanded to show themselves to the priests were cleansed on the way before they reached the priests by this it is indicated that before we open our mouths to the priests that is confess our sins we are cleansed from the leprosy of sin lazarus was also not first led out of the tomb and afterward awakened by the lord but was awakened within and came forth alive that the awakening of the spirit might be shown to precede confession for no one can confess unless aroused because confession by one dead as by one who is not does not exist therefore no one confesses unless aroused but no one is aroused except he who is absolved from sin because sin is the death of the soul and as the soul is the life of the body so its own life is god from these and many other authorities it is proved that before confession or satisfaction sin is forgiven upon contrition alone and those who deny it find it hard to explain these authorities and they introduce the testimony of other authorities for the overthrow of this opinion and the support of their own for the lord says through isaiah tell thou thy iniquities that thou mayest be justified see isaiah forty three twenty six also ambrose no man can be justified from sin unless he has first confessed the sin itself he also says confession frees the soul from death confession opens paradise confession gives the hope of salvation because he does not deserve to be justified who is not willing to confess his sin in this lifetime confession frees us which is done with penance but penance is the grief of the heart and the bitterness of the soul for the evils which each one has committed also john 
no one can receive the grace of god unless he has been purified of all sin by the confession of penance and by baptism footnote chromotatius question mark c non posti quis forty one ibid End footnote. also augustine do penance as it is done in the church let no one say to himself i do it secretly because i do it before god god knows who has pardoned me because i do it in my heart then without cause was it said what thou loosest on earth shall be loosed in heaven then without cause were the keys given then we make vain the word of christ job says if i have blushed to confess my sins in the sight of the people also ambrose the guilt is venial which is followed by confession of sins also augustine on this passage of the psalm let not the deep swallow me up and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me says the pit is the deep of iniquity into which if thou hast fallen its mouth shall not close upon thee if thou dost not close thy mouth confess therefore and say out of the depths have i cried unto thee o lord etc and thou shalt escape it closes upon him who has despised it in the depth from whom in death just as from one who is not there can be no confession also no one receives pardon for a more grievous debt of penalty unless he has paid some kind of penalty even if much less than he owes for so the liberality of mercy is granted us by god that the justice of discipline be not neglected also jerome let him who is a sinner lament his own sins or those of the people and let him enter the church from which he had wandered on account of sin and let him sleep in sackcloth that he may compensate by austerity of life for the earlier pleasures by which he offended god by these and other authorities they endeavor to prove that without oral confession and some payment of penalty no one can be cleansed from sin what therefore is to be thought about these things what believed it can certainly be said that without confession of the mouth and payment of the outward penalty sins are effaced by contrition and humility of heart for from the moment any one proposes to confess being pricked in conscience god forgives because there is there the confession of the heart though not of the mouth by which the soul is cleansed within from the stain and contagion of committed sin and the debt of eternal death is relaxed therefore that which was said above regarding confession and penance should be referred either to the confession of the heart or to inward punishment just as this saying of augustine that no one obtains pardon unless first he has paid some small penalty for his sin must be understood of the external penalty and applied to the scornful or negligent just as this let no one say i do it secretly etc for some neglect to confess sins in their lifetime and are ashamed to do it and therefore do not deserve to be justified for just as inward penance is enjoined upon us so also confession of the mouth and outward satisfaction if we have the opportunity wherefore he is not truly penitent who does not have the desire to confess and just as remission of sin is the gift of god so penance and confession by which sin is wiped out cannot take place save from god as augustine says now he says he has the gift of the holy spirit who confesses and repents because there cannot be confession of sin and compunction in man of himself 
for when any one is angry at himself and dissatisfied with himself it is not without the gift of the holy spirit therefore a penitent ought to confess his sins if he have time and yet before confession of the mouth if there is the promise in the heart forgiveness is extended to him end of the sentences of peter lombard book four sacraments excerpts translated by elizabeth francis rogers eighteen ninety two to nineteen seventy four published in nineteen seventeen the silent city of the muir glacier by david stark jordan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org mr richard g willoughby is a mining prospector and promoter resident in juneau alaska a man whose vocation enables him to see some wonderful things in june 1888 according to his statement mr willoughby beheld an extraordinary mirage from the surface of the muir glacier it was the apparition of a great city of tall houses of brick and stone plainly shown in the air under the influence of some powerful refraction behind the city was a river in which shipping was faintly shown in the foreground the leafless branches of tall elm trees were clearly traceable in the center of the city was a large edifice with several towers and on some of these towers the presence of scaffolding showed that building was still going on this mirage was seen by him several times from year to year and on the unfinished building the stages in the process of erection each season could be distinctly followed mr willoughby sent to san francisco and secured a camera with a number of highly sensitized plates of the usual commercial sort in order to photograph the apparition this he succeeded in doing but once successfully the necessary exposure was a very long one because of the unsubstantiality of the object the one negative however gave a fairly clear print copies were at once made and r g willoughby's silent city seventy-five cents each was added to the wonders of alaska i present herewith a copy of this picture bought by me in sitka in eighteen ninety six the picture is not quite the same as the original edition of eighteen eighty eight the scene is exactly identical but the card has been reduced in size by the omission of superfluous sky it has been rendered much fainter and more ghost-like than the original and is perhaps taken from a new negative in which the lines of the houses and gravel walks have been purposely made less distinct the original edition has the following on the back of the card the glacial wonder of the silent city for the past fifteen years professor richard willoughby has been a character in alaska as well known among the whites as he has been familiar to the natives as one of the early settlers of old fort wrangell in which his individuality was stamped among the sturdy miners who frequented the then important trading port of alaska he has grown with the territory and is today as much a part of its history as the totem poles are identified with the deeds of valor or commemorative of the past triumphs of prominent members of the tribes which their hideous and mysterious characters represent to him belongs the honor of being the first american who discovered gold within alaska's icy bound peaks but his greatest achievement from a scientific standpoint is his tearing from the glacier's chilly bosom the mirages of cities from distant climes after four years of labor amid dangers privations and sufferings he accomplished for the civilized world a feat in photography heretofore considered problematic it was on the longest day of june 1888 that the camera took within its grasp the reproduction of a city remote if indeed not altogether within the recesses of another world the silent city is here presented for the consideration of the public as the wonder and pride of alaska's bleak hills 
and the ever-changing glaciers may never again afford a like opportunity for the accomplishment of this sublime phenomena the picture attracted much attention and met with an encouraging sale the sceptical bought it as an original document in the natural history of mendacity the credulous regarded it as a wonder not surpassed by the gigantic glacier itself the discussion arose in the newspapers as to whether some distant city as montreal could have been brought into view by the freaks of the marvellous alaskan atmosphere many who thought this impossible leaned to the belief that in the heart of alaska or in british columbia there is some great settlement of civilized men as yet undiscovered by geographers to those who held this opinion neither the nearness of the houses to the observer nor the peculiarities of the vegetation leafless elm trees in midsummer nor the tiles on the chimneys offered any difficulties the obvious but commonplace explanation was that of the few only even now every summer some account of the marvel goes the rounds of the newspapers i am told that in eighteen ninety six a company of people encamped for some time on the glacier in hopes of seeing this great wonder of nature they did not see it unfortunately but others had better success and these lucky ones have recently substantiated their account by their affidavits an affidavit in juneau cost but a drink of whiskey the usual price along the northwest coast a fact of which one great nation of our day has not been slow to profit in the connection with an international tribunal of arbitration as the sale of photographs declines more persons will probably be granted a sight of the silent city and there will arise a new series of affidavits and newspaper stories it is hardly necessary to call the attention of the intelligent reader to the absurdities involved in mr willoughby's story and in the photograph which is its financial justification but there are many persons not without education and culture who believe without the least question any tale which is uncanny or which seems outside the ordinary run of things in vain does science protest that the natural order is the only order there is that all contradictions to it are either so in appearance only or else are deceptions or frauds an interest in human psychology led dr charles h gilbert then acting as naturalist on the albatross to investigate mr willoughby's methods of photography he learned from mr willoughby that the plates used were of the ordinary sort but the mirage required a very long exposure to set the picture mr willoughby had had no previous knowledge of photography and had never tried to reproduce anything except mirages the chemicals used in developing the negative he would not describe it was a secret process the exposed plates had to be soaked for three months in the secret compound before the picture would be fixed this soaking took place in the open daylight no dark room being required nor did mr willoughby seem aware of the ordinary function of the dark chamber in photography the original negative examined by dr gilbert was a very old stained and faded plate apparently a negative which had been discarded because underexposed professor william h hudson of stanford university who lived for a time in bristol england recognizes the picture as a view of that city from brandon hill above the town the picture must have been taken some twenty years ago because professor hudson distinctly remembers the scaffolding around the towers of bristol cathedral at that time while the building was being repaired the hotel and the church to the left of the cathedral are also recognized by him a more transparent fraud could hardly be devised but its very imbecility assures its success we may be certain that for many years to come the silent city will be the wonder and pride of alaska's bleak hills and tourists eager to pierce the veil will speculate on the probability of its being perhaps altogether within the recesses of another world thus it comes about as i have elsewhere said that there is no intellectual craze so absurd as not to have a following among educated men and women there is no scheme for the renovation of the social order so silly that educated men will not invest their money in it 
there is no medical fraud so shameless that educated men will not give it their certificate there is no nonsense so unscientific that men called educated will not accept it as science end of the silent city of the muir glacier by david stark jordan read by phil schempf the story of sinui by unknown translated by alan gardner this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the hereditary prince and count governor of the domains of the sovereign and the lands of the setiu true acquaintance of the king beloved of him the henchman sinui he says i was a henchman who followed his lord a servant of the royal harem attending on the hereditary princess the highly praised royal consort of sesostris in the pyramid town of kenem isat the royal daughter of amenemes in the pyramid town of kenofru even nofru the revered in year thirty third month of inundation day seven the god attained his horizon the king of upper and lower egypt sehetebra he flew to heaven and was united with the sun's disk the flesh of the god was merged in him who made him then was the residence hushed hearts were filled with mourning the great portals were closed the courtiers crouched head on lap the people grieved now his majesty had dispatched an army to the land of the timhi and his eldest son was the captain thereof the good god sesostris even now he was returning having carried away captives of the tehenu and cattle of all kinds beyond number and the companions of the royal palace sent to the western border to acquaint the king's son with the matters that had come to pass at the court and the messengers met him on the road they reached him at time of night not a moment did he wait the falcon flew away with his henchmen not suffering it to be known to his army howbeit message had been sent to the royal children who were with him in this army and one of them had been summoned and lo i stood and heard his voice as he was speaking being a little distance aloof and my heart became distraught my arms spread apart trembling having fallen on all my limbs leaping i betook myself thence to seek me a hiding place and placed me between two brambles so as to sunder the road from its traveller i set out southward yet purposed not to approach the residence for i thought there would be strife and i had no mind to live after him I crossed the waters of Mekoti, hard by the sycamore, and arrived in island of Snowfru. I tarried there in the open fields, and was afoot early when it was day. I met a man who rose up in my path. He showed dismay of me, and feared. When the time of supper came, I drew nigh to the town of Gu. I ferried over in a barge without a rudder, by the help of a western breeze, and passed on by the east of the quarry in the district mistress of the Red Mountain. I gave a road to my feet northward, and attained the wall of the prince, which was made to repel the setiu, and to crush the sandfarers. I bowed me down in a thicket through fear, lest the watcher on the wall for the day might see. I went on at time of night, and when it dawned I reached Petney. I halted at the island of Kimware. An attack of thirst overtook me. I was parched, my throat burned, and I said, This is the taste of death. Then I lifted my heart, and gathered up my body. I heard the sound of the lowing of cattle, and espied men of the Setiu. A sheik among them, who was aforetime in Egypt, recognized me, and gave me water. He boiled for me milk. I went with him to his tribe, and they entreated me kindly. Land gave me to land. I set forth to Byblos. I pushed on to Kedmi. I spent half a year there. Then Inshi, son of Amu, prince of upper retinue, took me and said to me, Thou farest well with me, for thou hearest the tongue of Egypt. This he said, for that he had become aware of my qualities, he had heard of my wisdom. Egyptian folk who were there with him had testified concerning me. And he said to me, Wherefore art thou come hither? 
hath aught befallen at the residence? And I said to him, Shehetebra is departed to the horizon, and none knoweth what has happened in this matter. And I spoke again dissembling. I came from the expedition to the land of the Timhi, and report was made to me, and my understanding reeled. My heart was no longer in my body. It carried me away on the path of the wastes. Yet none had spoken evil of me, none had spat in my face. I had heard no reviling word, my name had not been heard in the mouth of the herald. I know not what brought me to this country. It was like the dispensation of God. Then said he to me, How shall yon land fare without him, the beneficent God, the fear of whom was throughout the lands like Sakmet in a year of plague? Spake I to him, and answered him, Of a truth his son has entered the palace, and has taken the inheritance of his father. A god is he without a peer, none other surpasses him. A master of prudence is he, excellent in counsel, efficacious in decrees. Goings and comings are at his command. It is he who subdued the foreign lands while his father was within his palace, and reported to him what was ordered him to do. Valiant is he, achieving with his strong arm, active and none is like to him, when he is seen charging down on Ro Pedita, or approaching the Malay. A curber of horns is he, a weakener of hands, his enemies cannot marshal their ranks. Vengeful is he, a smasher of foreheads, none can stand in his neighborhood. Long of stride is he, destroying the fugitive. There is no ending for any that turns his back to him. Stout of heart is he when he sees a multitude. He suffers not sloth to encompass his heart. Headlong is he when he falls upon the Easterners. His joy is to plunder the Ropichu. He seizes the buckler. He tramples under foot. He repeats not his blow in order to kill. None can turn his shaft or bend his bow. The Petu flee before him as before the might of the great goddess. He fights without end. He spares not, and there is no remnant. He is a master of grace. Great in sweetness, he conquers through love. His city loves him more than itself. It rejoices over him more than over its god. Men and women pass by in exultation concerning him now that he is king. He conquered while yet in the egg. His face has been set toward kingship ever since he was born. He is one who multiplies those who were born with him. He is unique, God-given. The land that he rules rejoices. He is one who enlarges his borders. He will conquer the southern lands, but he heeds not the northern lands. He was made to smite the Setu, and to crush the sandfarers. Send to him, let him know thy name utter no curse against his majesty. He fails not to do good to the land that is loyal to him. Said he to me, Of a truth Egypt is happy, since it knows that he prospers. But thou, behold, thou art here. Thou shalt dwell with me, and I will entreat thee kindly. And he placed me even before his children, and mated me with his eldest daughter. He caused me to choose for myself of his country, of the best that belonged to him on his border to another country. It was a goodly land called Ya'a. Figs were in it and grapes, and its wine was more abundant than its water. Plentiful was its honey, many were its olives, all manner of fruits were upon its trees. Wheat was in it and spelt, and limitless cattle of all kinds. Great also was that which fell to my portion by reason of the love bestowed on me. He made me ruler of a tribe of the best of his country. Food was provided me for my daily fare, and wine for my daily portion, cooked meat and roast fowl, over and above the animals of the desert. For men hunted and laid before me in addition to the quarry of my dogs. And there were made for me many dainties, and milk prepared in every way. I spent many years, and my children grew up as mighty men, each one controlling his tribe. The messenger who fared north or south to the residence tarried with me, for I caused all men to tarry. I gave water to the thirsty, and set upon the road him who was strayed. I rescued him who was plundered. When the Setu waxed insolent to oppose the chieftains of the deserts, I counseled their movements, for this prince of retinue caused me to pass many years as commander of his host. 
every country against which i marched when i made my assault it was driven from its pastures and wells i spoiled its cattle i made captive its inhabitants i took away their food i slew people in it by my strong arm by my bow by my movements and by my excellent counsels i found favour in his heart and he loved me he marked my bravery and placed me even before his children when he had seen that my hands prevailed there came a mighty man of retinue and flaunted me in my tent he was a champion without a peer and had subdued the whole of retinue he vowed that he would fight with me he planned to rob me he plotted to spoil my cattle by the counsel of his tribes folk the prince communed with me and i said i know him not forsooth i am no confederate of his nor one who strode about his encampment yet have i ever opened his door or overthrown his fence nay it is envy because he sees me doing thy behest assuredly i am like a wandering bull in the midst of a strange herd and the steer of those cattle charges him a longhorn attacks him is there a humble man who is beloved in the condition of a master there is no petty that makes cause with a man of the delta what can fasten the papyrus to the rock does a bull love combat and shall then a stronger bull wish to sound the retreat through dread lest that one might equal him if his heart be toward fighting let him speak his will does god ignore what is ordained for him or knows he how the matter stands at night time i strung my bow and tried my arrows i drew out my dagger and polished my weapons day dawned and retinue was already come it had stirred up its tribes and had assembled the countries of a half of it it had planned this fight forth he came against me where i stood and i posted myself near him every heart burned for me women and men jabbered every heart was sore for me saying is there another mighty man who can fight against him then his shield his battle-axe and his armful of javelins fell when i had escaped from his weapons and had caused his arrows to pass by me uselessly sped while one approached the other i shot him my arrow sticking in his neck he cried aloud and fell on his nose i laid him low with his own battle-axe and raised my shout of victory over his back every ah am shrieked i gave thanks to montu but his serfs mourned for him this prince enshi son of amma took me to his embrace then i carried off his possessions and spoiled his cattle what he had devised to do unto me that did i unto him i seized what was in his tent i ransacked his encampment i became great thereby i grew large in my riches i became abundant in my flocks thus god has done so as to show mercy to him who he had condemned whom he had made wander to another land for to-day is his heart satisfied a fugitive fled in his season now the report of me is in the residence a laggard lagged because of hunger now i give bread to my neighbor a man left his country because of nakedness but i am clad in white raiment and linen a man sped for lack of one whom he should send but i am a plenteous owner of slaves beautiful is my house wide my dwelling-place the remembrance of me is in the palace o god whosoever thou art that didst ordain this flight show mercy and bring me to the residence peradventure thou wilt grant me to see the place where my heart dwelleth what matter is greater than that my corpse should be buried in the land wherein i was born come to my aid a happy event has befallen i have caused god to be merciful may he do the like again so as to ennoble the end of him who he had abased his heart grieving for him whom he had compelled to live abroad if it so be that to-day he is merciful may he hear the prayer of one afar off may he restore him whom he had stricken to the place whence he took him o may the king of egypt show mercy to me that i may live by his mercy may i salute the lady of the land who is in his palace may i hear the behests of her children o let my flesh grow young again for old age has befallen feebleness has overtaken me mine eyes are heavy my hands are weak my legs refuse to follow my heart is weary and death approaches me 
when they shall bear me to the city of eternity. Let me serve my sovereign lady. O oh, let her discourse to me of her children's beauty. May she spend an eternity over me. Now it was told the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Kipurkere, concerning the pass wherein I was. Thereupon his majesty sent to me with gifts of the royal bounty, and gladdened the heart of this his servant, as it had been the prince of any foreign country. And the royal children who were within his palace caused me to hear their behests. Copy of the decree which was brought to this humble servant concerning his return to Egypt. Horus, life of births, two goddesses, life of births, king of upper and lower Egypt, Kapurkere, son of Ra, Sesostris, living for ever and ever. A royal decree unto the henchman Sinui. Behold, this decree of the king is brought to thee to instruct thee as following. Thou hast transversed the foreign lands, and art gone forth from Kedme to Retinue. Land gave thee to land, self-counseled by thy own heart. What hadst thou done that aught should be done against thee? Thou hadst not blasphemed, that thy words should be reproved. Thou hadst not spoken in the council of the nobles, that thy utterances should be banned. This determination, it seized thine own heart. It was not in my heart against thee. This thy heaven, who is in the palace, is established and prospereth daily. She hath her part in the kingship of the land. Her children are at the court. Mayest thou long enjoy the goodly things that they shall give thee. Mayest thou live by their bounty. Come thou to Egypt, that thou mayest see the residence where thou didst grow, that thou mayest kiss the earth at the great portals, and have thy lot among the companions. For to-day already thou hast begun to be old, thy manhood is spent. Bethink thee of the day of burial, the passing into beatitude, how that the night shall be decoded to thee with ointments, with bandages from the hands of Tate, and a funeral possession shall be made for thee on the day of joining the earth, the mummy shell of gold with head of lazuli, and a heaven above thee, and thou placed upon the hearse, oxen dragging thee, musicians in front of thee, and there shall be performed the dance of the Mu'u at the door of thy tomb. And the offering list shall be invoked for thee, and slaughterings made beside thy stela, thy columns being sharp of white stone amid the tombs of the royal children. Thus shalt thou not die abroad. Aamu shall not escort thee. Thou shalt not be placed in a sheepskin when thy mound is made. Yea, all these things shall fall to the ground. Wherefore, think of thy corpse, and come. This decree reached me as I stood in the midst of my tribesfolk. It was read aloud to me, and I laid me on my belly, and touching the soil, I strode it on my hair. And I went about my encampment rejoicing and saying, How should such things be done to a servant whom his heart led astray to barbarous lands? Fair in sooth is the graciousness which delivereth me from death inasmuch as thy call will grant me to accomplish the ending of my body at home. Copy of the Acknowledgement of this Decree The servant of the harem, Sinui, says, Fair hail, discerned is this flight that thy servant made in, in his witlessness. Yea, even by thy ka, thou good God, Lord of the two lands, whom Ra loves, and Montu, Lord of Thebes, praises. Amun, Lord of Karnak, Sob, Ra, Horus, Hathor, Atom with his Aeneid, Sopdu, Neferbayu, Simseru, Horus of the East, the Lady of Imet who rests on thy head, the conclave upon the waters, men in the midst of the deserts, Wereret, Lady of Punt, Harure, and all the gods of Timuri, and of the islands of the sea. They give life and strength to thy nose, they endue thee with thy gifts. They give to thee eternal, illimitable time without born. The fear of thee is brooded abroad in cornlands and desert hills. Thou hast subdued all the circuit of the sun. This thy servant's prayer to his lord to rescue him in the west, the lord of perception, who perceiveth lowly folk. He perceived it in his noble palace. Thy servant feared to speak it. Now it is like some grave circumstance to repeat it. Thou great God! 
peer of raw in giving discretion to one toiling for himself. This thy servant is in the hand of a good counsellor in his behalf. Verily I am placed beneath his guidance. For thy majesty is the victorious Horus, thy hands are strong against all lands. Let now thy majesty cause to be brought Maki from Kedme, Kintiosh from Kinkesh, Menus from the lands of the Finku. They are renowned princes who have grown up in love of thee, albeit unremembered. Retinue is thine, like to thy hounds. But as touching this thy servant's flight, I planned it not. It was not in my heart. I conceived it not. I know not what sundered me from my place. It was the manner of a dream, as when a delta man sees himself in elephantine, a man of the marshes in Totseti. I had not feared. None had pursued after me. I had heard no reviling word. My name had not been heard in the mouth of the herald. Nay, but my body quivered, my feet began to scurry, my heart directed me, the God who ordained this flight drew me away. Yet am I not stiff-backed, inasmuch as suffering the fear of a man that knows his land? For Ra has set the fear of thee throughout the land, the dread of thee in every foreign country. Whether I be at home, or whether I be in this place, it is thou that canst obscure yon horizon. The sun riseth at thy pleasure, the water in the rivers is drunk at thy will, the air in heaven is breathed at thy word. Thy servant will hand over the viziership which thy servant hath held in this place. But let thy majesty do as pleaseth thee. Men live by the breath that thou givest. Ra, Horus, and Hathor love this thy august nose, which Montu, lord of Thebes, wills should live eternally. Envoys came to this servant, and I was suffered to spend a day in Ya'a, to hand over my possessions to my children, my eldest son taking charge of my tribe, all my possessions being in his hand, my serfs and all my cattle, my fruit and every pleasant tree of mine. Then came this humble servant southward, and halted at paths of Horus. The commander who was there in charge of the frontier patrol sent a message to the residents to bear tidings and his majesty sent a trusty head fowler of the palace, having with him ships laden with presents of the royal bounty for the Setiu, that were come with me to conduct me to paths of Horus. And I named each several one of them by his name. Brewers needed and strained in my presence, and every serving man made busy with his task. Then I set out and sailed until I reached the town of Iktui. And when the land was lightened, and it was morning there came men to summon me, ten coming and ten going to convey me to the palace. And I pressed my forehead to the ground between the sphinxes, the royal children standing in the gateway against my coming. The companions that had been ushered into the forecourt showed me the way to the hall of audience. And I found his majesty on a throne in a gateway of gold. And I stretched myself on my belly, and my wit forsook me in his presence, albeit this god greeted me joyously. Yea, I was like a man caught in the dusk. My soul fled, my flesh quaked, and my heart was not in my body that I should know life from death. Thereupon his majesty said to one of those companions, Raise him up, let him speak to me. And his majesty said, Lo, thou art come. Thou hast trodden the deserts, thou hast traversed the wastes, Eld has prevailed against thee, thou hast reached old age. It is no small matter that thy corpse should be buried without escort of Petu. But do not thus, do not thus, staying ever speechless when thy name is pronounced. But verily I feared punishment, and answered him with the answer of one afraid. What speaketh my lord to me? Would I might answer it, and may not. Lo, it is the hand of God, yea, the dread that is in my body, like that which caused this fateful flight. Behold, I am in thy presence. Thine is life. May thy majesty do as pleases thee. The royal children were caused to be ushered in. Then his majesty said to the royal consort, Behold, Sanui, who is come as an Aam, an offspring of Setu folk. She gave a great cry, and the royal children shrieked out altogether. And they said to his majesty, It is not really he, O sovereign my lord. And his majesty said, Yea, it is really he. 
then brought they their necklaces their rattles and their sistra and presented them to his majesty thy hands be on the beauteous one o enduring king on the ornament of the lady of heaven may noob give life to thy nose may the lady of the stars join herself to thee let the goddess of upper egypt fare north and the goddess of lower egypt fare south united and conjoined in the name of thy majesty may the uraeus be set upon thy brow thou hast delivered thy subjects out of evil may ra lord of the land show thee grace hail to thee and also to our sovereign lady the horn of thy bow is slacked thine arrow loosened give breath to one that is stifled and grant us our goodly girdan in the person of this sheik Sumeut, the pedti born in Timuri. he fled through fear of thee he left this land through dread of thee but as for the face of him who sees thy majesty it blenches not as for the eye that regardeth thee it fears not then said his majesty nay but he shall not fear he shall not dread for he shall be a companion among the magistrates he shall sit in the midst of the nobles get you gone to the chamber of adornment to wait upon him so when i was gone forth from the hall of audience the royal children giving me their hands we went together to the great portals and i was placed in the house of a royal son there was noble equipment in it a bathroom and painted devices of the horizon costly things of the treasury were in it garments of royal stuff were in every chamber unguent and the fine oil of the king and of the courtiers whom he loves and every serving man made busy with his task years were caused to pass away from my flesh i was shaved and my hair was combed a burden was given over to the desert and clothing to the sandfarers and i was clad in soft linen and anointed with fine oil by night i lay upon a bed i gave up the sand to them that dwell therein and oil of wood to him who smears himself with it there was given to me the house of a provincial governor such as a companion may possess many artificers built it and all its woodwork was new appointed and meals were brought to me from the palace three times yea four times a day over and above that which the royal children gave without remiss and there was constructed for me a tomb of stone in the midst of the tombs the masons that hew tombs were marked out its ground plan the master draughtsmen designed in it the master sculptors carved in it and the master architects who are in the necropolis bestowed their care upon it and all the gear that is placed in a tomb shaft went to its equipment and call servants were given to me and there was made for me a sepulchral garden in which were fields in front of my abode even as is done for a chief companion and my statue was overlaid with gold and its apron was of real gold it was his majesty caused it to be made there is no poor man for whom the like hath been done and i enjoyed the favours of the royal bounty until the day of death came it is finished from the beginning to the end according as it was found in writing end of the story of sinui by unknown author translated by alan gardner recorded by philip gould A Tight Squeeze for Uncle George by Thomas Reed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Devora Allen I came near going on the stage once. Not to act, you understand. Not as bad as that. But simply to show stage managers a few things about their business. In the fresh springtime of my career, I never hesitated to butt, with a few pertinent suggestions, into any ancient art or science I ran across. And having, at the time of this tale, just made the acquaintance of the drama, as a means of livelihood, which had been plugging along quite a spell on scanty resources, I deigned to give even that lowly calling a little attention. The occasion was my Uncle George's taking me to the theatre for the first time. In those days, people approved of the theatre as heartily as they do of opium dens now, that is to say, scarcely at all, or less. But Unc had a theory that it was beneficial to make the devil's acquaintance young, so he insisted, as much as he had to, on my going along. 
we had to watch our step carefully, because a previous expedition of ours under his theory, I think it was a horse race, had caused unmistakable demur in the family. It made father almost impetuous. He said that while a pesky bachelor, Uncle George was such, might poison his own soul in any loathsome way he saw fit, it meant a hell sentence for him to lure innocent youth into the clutches of the evil one. And he went on to describe, for Unc's special benefit, the warmth of that particular hell reserved for middle-aged reprobates convicted of luring. This was before the invention of thermit and oxyacetylene, and the only fuel that theology possessed to get up steam for the sinners with was fire and brimstone. With the modern inflammables, father's imagination of hell would have made him such an extra hazard around the house as to vitiate our fire insurance policy. But he did pretty well with even the old-fashioned chemicals. He did so well, anyhow, that Uncle George, when he called to take me to the matinee, thought it prudent to employ camouflage, and carried conspicuously two smelt poles and a can of bait, which he left in a vacant lot after they had created the desired atmosphere of innocence. The theatre that agitated the old folks so meant plays like Uncle Tom's Cabin and Ten Nights in a Bar Room that dripped like a shirt in the ringer with morality and sadness. As even these dismal sketches were supposed irresistibly to skid the virtuous from the straight and narrow path, a stupefied horror overspread the community when, along in the eighties, came the first show that actually aimed to be merry. "'Good night,' said the community." So there was something worse, after all. This new show was The Black Crook. Today we should call it Spectacle and Extravaganza, and let it go at that. But to the elders it was a moral catastrophe, without any special classification. They objected to it practically in toto, as the fellow says. They objected to the story of the play, or plot, because it was a downright lie, not even founded on fact which at least you could say for Eliza's trip on the ice. And what did you think of the witches and fairies and men dressed up like animals? Didn't that give you false impressions of life? I should say so. Then look at the dancers and card trick players and actors that made believe intoxicated, all the forms of iniquity you ever heard of, and then some. But the most outrageous feature of all, the one mentioned with heavily bated breath, was the tights. Would you believe it? women, or beings in female form, actually came on the stage, wearing nothing but, sort of, stockings, you know, on their, their, well, what they wear stockings on. It was only after the black crook had departed, it had quite a long run before all the sinners were accommodated, that my spiritual health was regarded as beyond danger. But alas, you get me, it happened to be that very show which Uncle George took me to see. It surely was a busy afternoon for little nephew, with his inventive mind. The celebrated ladies in stockings were all that fancy painted, and more, for they'd done some painting on their own account. These, being the work of so competent an inventor as the devil, were clearly beyond my powers of improvement. But the mechanical devices promptly met with my usual constructive criticism. Our being seated in the front row helped some. Uncle George said he had to sit there on account of being very near-sighted. Not having heard of his infirmity before, I felt sorry for him, and told him so, after which my conscience allowed me to reap the benefit of his misfortune. Several inventions occurred to me, so close together that they almost overlapped. I mentioned them to Uncle George, but the Amazons were marching, and he seemed preoccupied. Evidently the show as it stood was good enough for him. The chief of these inventions was inspired by a beautiful blue light, studded with stars, which invaded the stage at certain intense moments. Something told me it was produced by a glass plate shoved in front of the calcium light, the display being heralded by the magnified image of the chipped edge of the plate, followed by a flock of elephant tracks, due to prints of the operator's fingers, stained by honest toil. At the first sight of this spectacle, the invention referred to burst upon me with that sort of phoratic shock familiar to inventors, particularly young ones. By the time it came again, my apparatus was completed, mentally, to the last detail. By the third view, I was storming the theatrical profession with it, and making lucrative contracts right and left, and the royalties were just about to pour in when the show was over, 
and Uncle George was suggesting that we leave the Temple of Thespis by the back door on Mason Street, it being handier to the car, also less handy to the public eye. My invention consisted of allying to the projection business what highbrows call a sister art, and my acquaintance with this sister, a modest violet now to be dragged into the garish light that beats upon the stage, came about in the following way. The Riverside Press in Cambridge, my native burg, was a favorite prowling ground for us kids. If you were good, and didn't bother any, you could stand and watch one of the big presses squeeze a sheet of paper, haul it out covered with book pages, and spank it down on top of a pile of previously printed ones, with an almost human emphasis that reminded you of the there, thank goodness, air of a woman ironing the last piece in the wash. Sometimes the printer would give you a sheet that had got spoiled by going in crooked, and you could read the middle eight pages of a detective story for nothing. Though, of course, a detective story with both the crime and the detection extracted is very low in percentage of thrill. Besides the printing, there were a hundred other processes to see, and each was so interesting that you never got very far in a single visit to the press. Before you knew it, the whistle would blow, the machinery would slow down and stop, and the workman would thank you for your kind attention and depart to see if he could find a clean place on the roller towel. One day, as I was exploring this palace of marvels, I came upon a workman over in a corner by himself, without a single power machine, and with only a tank and a lot of bottles. He was marbling paper, and the barbaric richness of his product was enough to make you dream you dwelt in marble halls, as the song goes. On the surface of his tank of water, he sprinkled drops of brilliant-colored oils, red, green, yellow, brown, the vividest tints in the tintery. Each drop, as it struck the water, floated and spread out in a perfect circle. Then, as he combed or swirled the surface with the simplest tools, the colored circles drew out, zigzagged, spiraled, scalloped, and finally came to rest in the intricate design of variegated marble. On this, a sheet of paper was gently let down, the oils adhered in an instant, and the design, as intangible as a bubble, was fixed forever. That was the invention which popped into my head at the theatre. To project on the stage these magnificent colored designs, shifting every instant like the figures in a kaleidoscope. The drawing speaks for itself. The invention's middle name was Simplicity. The tank for blending the colors was to be of glass. The beam from a stereo-opticon, condensed by lenses, was to cast upward an image of the colored film, which a mirror would then reflect into a horizontal direction to flood the stage. The stirring of the colors was to be done by a stream of air through a blowpipe, to keep the cause of the changes invisible. Fortune was mine, again. If the theatrical world would stand for that crude blue-and-star effect, unworthy of the inventive powers of a semi-intelligent janitor, what sort of transports would it throw at sight of my dizzying spectacle? Answer. Once seen, it would be universally demanded. With the monopoly of the business in my grasp, I felt that I must be firm with Keralfi, the spectacle king of those days. He would probably try to get, for almost nothing, my invention which was destined to lift his shows absolutely out of the commonplace. The experiment had to be tried out, of course, if only for gloating purposes. And fortunately, I had a small magic lantern as so much toward the equipment. I made a tank from a window pane surrounded by a wall of putty, and the lone workman at the press, out of regard for science, also to some extent for his own peace of mind, contributed an assortment of his liveliest pigments. My lantern being lighted, and everything ready for the test, I scattered a few drops of the various oils on the water in my tank, blew gently across the surface through a straw, and was delighted to see the colored discs stretch out, mingle in bands like a Roman sash, or form gorgeous designs varied from moment to moment, all projected in a magnified form on the whitewashed cellar wall. So far, I had got by without exciting the family suspicions of my dealings with the powers of darkness, as the magic lantern was a familiar household object, and I was always messing around with something or other. I was about ready to run away to New York and confer my invention on the waiting public when the enterprise was wrecked. Yes, sir, absolutely wrecked, simply by extending the experiment to a wholly unnecessary realism. 
At that time, my particular pal, and partner in undertakings of magnitude, was Gimp Skillings, who lived next door. The Skillingses were easy-going people, and Gimp was little hampered by restrictions. In fact, he lived the wild, free life of a man of the world, so far as it could be done on an income expressed in marbles and rusty nails rather than money. Gimp, of course, knew all about the theatre, and while his approval of my invention was enough to guarantee it in the winning class, he strongly advised adding to our equipment a model stage. It seemed superfluous to me, but Gimp was keen for it, claiming that Mr. Kuralfi always required a working model before signing a contract. In fact, it was the invariable custom in theatrical circles. That settled it, so we went to work and built a miniature stage out of a soapbox, painted with a proscenium arch and footlights, and hung with a series of cheesecloth curtains to reproduce the sensational finale of the Black Crook. A small doll of my sister's consented to assume the role of the Fairy Queen, standing with white robe, wings, and star-tipped wand behind the innermost curtain, to be revealed at the critical moment, rescue the lovers, and swat the crook into his flaming pit. The full-dress rehearsal came off at four o'clock one Saturday afternoon. It was a winter day, and cloudy at that, so it was practically pitch dark in the cellar, which, of course, was just what we wanted. Gimp worked the stage properties, while I handled the light. As I started the colors going, he raised the cheesecloth curtains one by one, declaiming the impressive climax of our favorite playlet, full of these and thous, with here and there a forsooth or two to give it tone. As the last curtain went up, exposing the doll in her fairy queen rig, Gimp turned on the full force of eloquence in the thrilling speech. Fear not, weak mortals, I will protect thee henceforth. And thou, O black crook, down, down with thee to the nethermost depths and the torments of the damned. Whereupon Gimp opened the furnace door and threw in a lump of coal to represent the crook. Now, damned was a word very much out of favor in those times. Its use was considered such extremely bad form that when Father met with it in reading the Bible aloud, he mumbled it apologetically, as though its presence even there had been due to a slip on someone's part. So when Gimp damned the crook, I glanced around involuntarily, as you will at a noise in a haunted house, even if you don't believe in ghosts. One glance, and my blood froze solid. Out of that part of the dense darkness which I knew was the cellar doorway, a face stood forth. Only a face, no body attached, illuminated by the red glare from the furnace. The face was father's. It looked as though our melodrama had got too good a start, and was about to unfold a new act on its own hook. Gimp and I shrank three sizes, and waited breathlessly. Breathless is often used to describe suspense, but it's generally an overstatement. Not in this case. Father opened up his performance with a sight act. Advancing on our theatrical equipment, he seized Gimp's stage in one hand and my pet apparatus in the other, and stuffed them into the furnace, where the ex-crook, with the rest of the coal, was glowing balefully. Then he cleared his throat for the speaking part. With a crime of such unusual juiciness to handle, it was up to Father to make a record. He did. He pounded like Elijah on the prophets of Baal, but not on me, on Gimp. And even on Gimp he lit only in passing, to denounce his supposed offense of enticing me to sin. Through Gimp, he was seizing the opportunity for his first good, healthy crack at the Skilling's family. It was bewildering to hear the vial of his wrath go bouncing down the field like a hot liner through the smarting hands of second base and shortstop. It was a three-bagger for the Skillingses, believe me. All the disapproval which he and mother had been nursing against their next-door neighbors since they first moved onto the street ten years before, tried to get off father's chest in a single package. The whole tale of their domestic shortcomings, from their soiled attic windows to their undisciplined, playmate-contaminating child. Father was not usually a rapid speaker, but this time you could almost hear the brakes squeak as his high-powered sentences fought each other for a place in the line. For my part, I knew this wasn't letting me out. Enticement was no excuse in our family, and I was scheduled later to get mine, with all the then-modern embellishments. But there was almost cheerfulness in the thought that Uncle George was escaping the taint of a cruel, if merited, suspicion. Gimp, as the scapegoat, was being somewhat roughly handled, to be sure. But Gimp's injuries could be settled for. 
if I could only keep him quiet. The outraged gimp at every chance was sputtering forth such preludes as, It wasn't... Say, look here! And most perilous of all, It was his unk... At every sputter I pinched him forcefully in the darkness, also in the leg, hissing, Cheese it! Let it go! I'll make it all right with you! And other soothing sounds, till finally I got him under control. The climax of father's speech came in a detailed list of the skillings' failings. He tried to use words of one syllable, so Gimp could take it home with him. But he had to give that up. It was no job for verbal flivers. As it progressed, one learned that the family's denuded and broken-fenced yard excited not pity, but contempt. That their cornet-playing border was a nuisance which called for the attention of the grand jury. While as to their persistent and pestiferous practice of purloining their neighbor's property under the subterfuge of borrowing, it was enough. It was enough. Just then his foot stubbed on a gloom-hidden object which clanked softly at him, like a watchful friend in a threatened predicament, whispering, Spill! It was the skillings as lawnmower, borrowed late in the season, and forgotten. Father's discourse came to a sudden end. He wasn't taken aback, you understand. He only happened to be seized with a coughing spell he was subject to in moments of excitement. He fled upstairs for relief. Uncle George was saved, and Gimp applied himself to estimating his damages. That was as near as I got to the stage, for my great invention remained in abeyance, owing to unfavorable business conditions. The Black Crook and its successors, Superba, Babes in the Wood, and many other aids to moral indigestion, ran their course and died their proprietors never suspecting that they'd actually missed the one real opportunity of their lives. End of A Tight Squeeze for Uncle George by Thomas Reed